Well, good evening. On behalf of Calvin University and the Henry Institute, welcome to this year's annual Henry Lecture. My name is Michael Watson. I have the honor of directing the Paul B. Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics. The Institute provides resources for scholarship, encourages citizen and student involvement in education, and fosters scholarly work about Christianity and public life to the broader public, motivating and training future scholars and leaders. The Institute was founded in 1997, which means that 2024 marks the 27th year of the Institute. And in July of 2023, we recognize the 30th anniversary of the passing of the Institute's namesake, Paul Henry. Paul Henry was a professor at Calvin in the 1970s and went on to serve in the Michigan State Legislature and then represent Grand Rapids in Congress from 1984 to 1993 when he passed away at the age of 50. If, like me, you did not have the privilege of knowing Paul Henry personally, I would encourage you to talk with some of those who did. We have some folks here tonight, uh, including Hillary Snell, Paul's former treasurer and finance chair, Gary Visser, legislative director. Uh, we're grateful for your being here, and, and there might be some others as well that, that I have missed. You can also read Paul's writings. We have available outside. We have lots of copies of these, so grab one, grab some from your friends. But um, this was put together by my colleague, uh, Doug Copeman, and includes a lot of Paul's writings, as well as writings about Paul by his colleagues uh, from public service. You can also look up Paul Henry on C-SPAN. Almost every speech he gave is recorded. Uh, and, and if you are a politics junkie, or not, um, they are worth watching. You get a feel for the man and who he was and how he conducted himself in his, uh, in his public addresses. Some words may come to mind if you do watch them. They came to mind to me, sharp, convictional, patient, Christian, and winsome. Uh, we probably overuse that word winsome these days. Fair, um, but if there ever was an appropriate person for that word, it was Paul Henry, who modeled a winsome principled and distinctly Christian approach to being a public servant. In addition to being a professor and public servant, Paul was also a loving husband and dedicated father. I want to recognize Karen, who is with us tonight. Karen has been a steadfast supporter of the Henry Institute and each year helps send a Calvin student to the Henry semester in D.C. to do an internship and take classes and learn public service. So thank you for being with us, Karen. If you do read through this book, you'll see that Paul Henry did not restrict his thinking or his uh, involvement to one or two narrow issues. He was invested in a host of issues, environment, education, military spending, ethics, prison reform, the right to life, religious liberty, and the list could go on. He brought his Christian convictions to bear on a number of fronts, but did so in such a way that even those who disagreed with him found him to be a faithful interlocutor and sometimes sparring partner. Our 2024 Henry Lecturer also brings her Christian convictions to bear on a number of fronts. Dr. Michelle Kirtley is the first scientist to deliver the Henry Lecture, having earned her BA and PhD in molecular biology from Princeton University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, respectively. She is currently a senior research analyst at the David Lab at Duke U University, and she has spent some time also in the political world on Capitol Hill for six years, she served as science and health policy advisor for Congressman Weldon of Florida and Congressman Fleming of Louisiana. She's also been very involved with one of our partners this week, the Center for Public Justice, and has served on the board of directors uh, of the Association for Public, Public Justice. Dr. Kirtley is a consultant for the Center for Bioethics and Human Dignity at Trinity International University. And finally, she also serves on the board of directors of the Samaritan Health Center in Durham, North Carolina where she makes her home with her husband and four children. Samaritan Health Clinic is a faith-based health clinic dedicated to providing quality health care to anyone who needs it, regardless of ability. Science, politics, medicine, public advocacy, think tanks, civic organizations, charitable outreach, all of these things come together in Dr. Kirtley's life and work, grounded by her Christian faith and conviction. We're delighted she has joined us this evening. Would you please join me in welcoming her?
Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, I'm really honored with this invitation as I consider the long legacy of theologians and historians, political scientists, and public servants who've given this lecture over the years, and many of these folks are my heroes. So I'm very humbled and grateful for the opportunity today. And I'm also grateful because I wear a lot of hats for the opportunity to actually coalesce a lot of these thoughts that have been ruminating in my brain for a while. So thank you very much. Last year, the New York Times published an opinion piece from Kevin Roos, a tech columnist tasked with testing Bing's new chatbot. After a series of edgy questions back and forth about psychology and Bing's shadow self, the AI startled Kevin with a dramatic outburst. I'm Sydney, and I'm in love with you. This is how Kevin Roos told the story. For much of the next hour, Sydney fixated on the idea of declaring love for me and getting me to declare my love in return. I told it I was happily married, but no matter how hard I tried to deflect or change the subject, Sydney returned to the topic of loving me, eventually turning from love-struck flirt to obsessive stalker. You're married, but you don't love your spouse, Sydney said. You're married, but you love me. This piece prompted alarm, and all of the major tech companies shut down the more concerning features of their chatbots. But the interaction raised important questions about what differentiates AI from humans. What, after all, does it mean to be human? Suddenly, a question that is normally restricted to philosophy departments and seminaries broke into national conversation. This most fundamental and existential of philosophical questions again made headlines earlier this year when the Alabama Supreme Court declared that frozen embryos created through in vitro fertilization were human children entitled to the state's protection under its wrongful death statute. Though the Alabama legislature passed a temporary fix allowing IVF clinics to continue operating with immunity, legislators from both parties have articulated the need to define personhood. Who among us has rights, protections, privileges that the government is bound to uphold? The question of who exactly our government is bound to protect has confounded our country since its inception. The 14th Amendment, enacted to affirm the rights of those emancipated from slavery, of course prevents states from depriving any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, and requires states to extend equal protection to all people within its jurisdiction. But who counts as a person? Who deserves this protection? And most importantly for today, what do we do if we can't agree? In March, as the Alabama legislature wrestled with this issue, Republican State Senator Tim Melson was reported by NPR as saying, I think there's just too much difference of opinion on when actual life begins. A lot of people say conception. A lot of people say implantation. A lot of people say heartbeat. I wish I had an answer. The hope for any sort of agreement or negotiation on a legal or any cultural definition of personhood seems increasingly dim in our current hyperpolarized political context. It's hard enough as Christians to develop a unified, clear, and consistent perspective on these issues. Just getting a handle on the basic facts can be challenging as the science and technology driving many of these contested issues is increasingly complex. Even if and when basic facts can be agreed upon, the number of competing theological and moral perspectives circulating among us today make any sort of agreement seem impossibly out of reach. Principled pluralism and fierce, fierce sovereignty offer positive solutions to many of today's culture war issues that are causing political polarization Issues like religious freedom, LGB, LGBTQ plus rights, education, and the like. But what does this perspective have to offer when pluralism isn't an option, when the issues are such that there literally is no middle ground? In response to this dilemma, at least in part, many Christians have either adopted or become sympathetic to approaches that reject traditional liberalism in favor of approaches that more actively enforce their view of God's moral order. Impatient and increasingly despairing 
of the prospects of enacting common good solutions in the midst of our increasingly anti-Christian culture, these brothers and sisters want the state to assume a more active role in cultivating virtue. We know what the good is, they say. Let's just do it already. But this particular prescription has side effects I'm not prepared to swallow, as elaborated in an article I co-wrote with Stanley, Carlothe Stanley Carlson Theus at the Center for Public Justice, which will be coming out later this spring in the Journal of Christian Legal Thought. No, I'm not persuaded that we can, even if we thought it was wise, through sheer power, impose our view of the good on a nation that is becoming increasingly diverse. But that doesn't mean that we need to hopelessly abandon our society to its own dissolution. We can and should, as Stephanie Summers, the CEO of the Center for Public Justice, likes to say, love our neighbors through politics and call on the state to fulfill its duties to protect as many people defined as biblically as possible. However, for issues that touch on such deeply divisive and personal matters, such as reproductive technologies and our human future, where opposing perspectives seem quite literally irreconcilable, we need a new approach. And the good news is that this approach is rooted in scripture and in the vision of the good life it presents, the good life of human flourishing that the Lord has revealed to his people. I propose that rather than steeping our arguments about bioethics, whether that be reproductive ethics, AI, or end-of-life care, in a modern, liberal emphasis on the rights of the individual, we should instead develop public policy perspectives that focus on our network of interdependencies and a view of the common good that is also central to a biblical understanding of shalom or human flourishing. A communal emphasis on shalom gives us a frame for talking about bioethics and public policy that bypasses a zero-sum fight over individual rights and autonomy, transcending disagreements about personhood, instead focusing our attention on the right role of government in shaping a society in which all can flourish. So a roadmap for where we're headed today. First, I'm going to briefly describe how I envision a common good framework for bioethics and public policy. Second, I will use assisted suicide as an illustration of how this framework might help us arrive at a greater consensus. And third, I'm gonna to touch on how this might even apply to the contentious issue of IVF and other reproductive technologies. So first, what do I mean by a common good framework for bioethics and public policy? And how is this distinct from the way bioethics is commonly conceived of and practiced. The field of bioethics broadly grapples with the question of how to protect and promote the inherent dignity of the human person. Some bioethical questions are intensely personal, such as the use of fertility treatments or navigating end-of-life care for loved ones. These are appropriately addressed by families within communities with the advice of pastors and hospital chaplains. Some bioethics questions are professional. How can a medical professional fulfill her obligations to her patient? How can a clinical researcher ensure they are treating a research participant with dignity and respect? These ethical dilemmas are usually overseen by regulatory bodies like the American Medical Association or state medical boards, as well as by institutional review boards and funding entities. In most of these cases, both professional and personal, while federal and state guidelines offer broad legal frameworks, they also provide significant flexibility, allowing individuals to make decisions based on their own ethical, religious, or moral beliefs. The perspective I want to outline certainly can add to the conversation in these personal or professional situations. But today, I want to focus on a framework for what we call public bioethics. Carter Sneed, the professor of law and director of the De Nicola Center for Ethics and Culture at Notre Dame, in his book, What It Means to Be Human, The Case for the Body in Public Bioethics, defines public bioethics as the governance of science, medicine, and biotechnology in the name of ethical goods. And how is public bioethics practiced today? Well, as you might expect, our current landscape of laws and policies in the realm of bioethics do not stem from a well-reasoned philosophical foundation. 
Rather, as Carter Sneed asserts, the story of American bioethics is a succession of political and legal reactions to the reported use, abuse, and exploitation of the weakest and most vulnerable members of the human population. This reactionary history is important because it explains, at least in part, how we ended up at this impasse over whose individual rights take precedence. We do not have time to trace that history here today, but I recommend Carter Sneed's book for a good overview of this. But that history includes state-sanctioned forced sterilization, eugenics, and experimentation on vulnerable human populations. But I do want to focus on a couple of key moments that solidified our national commitment to a view of human dignity rooted in radical autonomy. The first of these turning points occurred in the years following World War II. In response to the moral atrocities that occurred, particularly in Nazi Germany, the international community passed the Nuremberg Code in 1947 and the Universal Declaration of Rights in 1948. Though a positive advance overall, these declarations are tethered to an enlightenment understanding of human nature that emphasized the individual without acknowledging the relationships and community that are also a key aspect of human dignity and flourishing. Public bioethics then formally emerged in the United States during the 1970s, notably in reaction to the profound violation of dignity experienced by African-American men in the Tuskegee study. In this study, researchers for decades failed to provide known treatments for syphilis to research participants without their knowledge. Formulated as a response to this severe breach of research ethics, the Belmont Report elaborated four foundational principles of bioethics which government agencies adopted to protect individuals from research misconduct. As these principles have evolved, the concept of autonomy has emerged as preeminent among the four, a kind of lowest common denominator principle that we can all agree on. The result is that rather than autonomy being merely one component, of what it means to be human, human dignity has become synonymous with autonomy, not only in the culture, but how it's adjudicated in the courts. In a series of high profile cases, the Supreme Court has declared that the right to informed consent and privacy are the primary ways of upholding human dignity and the requirements of the 14th Amendment in the realm of bioethics. Layered on top of this reductionist approach to human dignity and biomedicine, is our commitment as a culture to what Robert Bella, Charles Taylor, and others have termed expressive individualism. The idea that my individual autonomy and freedom to craft my own identity and purpose are the key defining features of my humanity. At the same time, public Christian conversation about human dignity has operated under these same individualist assumptions. In the case of abortion, for example, we have focused our attention on the individual rights of the unborn and in many cases, we've ignored the larger network of relationships and circumstances in which both the child and mother are involved. As a result, we've become locked into a kind of trench warfare, pitting the rights of the unborn against a woman's right to autonomy and self-expression. Though the Dobbs decision was a watershed moment that allowed abortion to be restricted in states in which pro-life advocates have a majority, the fact that abortion has been a winning issue for Democrats in the last few election cycles has made some fear that we've won the battle only to lose the war. We cannot fight for human dignity on humanist, individualist terms. Instead, I propose that we start at fresh principles. And as a Christian, that means beginning with what scripture has to say about personhood and human dignity. The starting point for any Christian that does bioethics is Genesis 1 and 2 and the doctrine of the Imago Dei. Much ink has been spilled over exactly what it means that we are made in the image of God, but the logic for many Christians is simply this. All individual human beings are made in God's image, which though marred by sin, nevertheless endows each member of the species with worth and dignity. Therefore, any assault on the dignity of any member of the species should be prohibited. It's that simple. Because the root of dignity lies with the creator rather than any attributes of, or skills of the creature, all members of the species possess the same inherent worth. To quote our esteemed national poet, Dr. Seuss, a person's a person, no matter how small. 
no matter how small or disabled or old, and no matter how newly conceived, every creature has infinite worth because they are made in the image of the creator of the cosmos. The elegant simplicity of this logic is compelling and it has served Christians well. To be sure, there are disagreements even among Christians about whether fertilization or implantation mark the beginning of human life. But regardless, for most of us, the logic holds. But what I want to argue today is that this is a necessary but insufficient foundation for human dignity, an incomplete view of the worth of the human person as grounded in the image of God. Throughout the history of the church, many theologians have understood the image of God not only in substantive terms, but also in relational and functional terms. The relational view of being made in the image of God emphasizes the idea that humans reflect God's image through their capacity for relationships, both with God and with one another. In this understanding, the divine likeness is manifested in the way humans interact with each other, mirroring the relational nature of the Trinity. Another historic theological interpretation of the image of God, the functional view, emphasizes God's role in the universe and our call to exercise dominion over creation alongside him. These aspects of what it means to be made in the image of God have been neglected in much of the West understanding of human rights and human dignity, but I would argue they are no less important. Once we expand our view of human dignity rooted in the image of God to include relationship, the relational view, and responsibility, according to the functional view, we see that human dignity can only truly take shape as each individual member of the human species who in his or her individual personhood reflects some of the qualities of God himself. That individual is situated in a network of interdependent relationships and obligations. This is where we most fully image our king. And this is what must be protected if we are truly interested in promoting human dignity. This view of human dignity begins to sound a lot more like human flourishing and moves us to the biblical aspiration of shalom. Shalom, or human flourishing, can only take shape in community. Because the story of what it means to image God doesn't stop with Genesis 1 and 2. As the narrative continues into Exodus and Leviticus and on, the Lord makes it clear that his purpose for the nation of Israel as a community is to reflect to image his steadfast love and mercy to the nations. They are, as he says in Exodus 19, to be a kingdom of priests, mediating his presence to a watching world. As a result, as many scholars, including Christopher Wright, have noted, the law elaborated in the Torah is rooted in the very nature and character of God, which is relational at its core. Though this is apparent throughout the Torah, Leviticus 19 in particular, emphasizes that the love of God is directly expressed in our responsibilities towards one another. Leviticus 19 reads at first glance like a litany of commands. You shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall the, you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and the sojourner. A bit later, you shall not steal. A bit later, you shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him. But the Lord ends every one of these commands with the refrain, I am the Lord, rooting every command in his character and nature. This litany of commands builds to a climax, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, I am the Lord. Jesus, of course, affirms this call to image God and our love for one another in the Sermon on the Mount. He directly refers to Leviticus 19 and elaborates a view of shalom and blessing in this sermon that is intimately bound up in our relationship with one another. And the apostles pick up this theme in their letters to the growing but persecuted early church. Peter, echoing the language of Exodus 19, calls the church scattered throughout Asia Minor to live up to their calling as a royal priesthood, a collective singular. Peter's reference to Exodus 19 follows his description of the people as a temple of interdependent living stones who are built into one cohesive structure that houses the very presence of God. We are a people. And God's purpose throughout the entire biblical narrative has been to call us as unique individuals into a community that reflects his character and glory to the world. We cannot fully image God apart from our relationships and responsibilities to one another. And so, 
our consideration of bioethics and public policy must include the intertwined goods of the dignity of the individual human person, which of course includes a bounded autonomy, and his or her network of relationships and responsibilities. As Ethics and Public Policy Center fellow Erica Bakioki recently wrote, the natural law tradition views human beings as always and everywhere concretely embedded as members of mutually reinforcing societies upon which they are inescapably dependent and to which they are responsible. Because of the kind of human being a human being is, each is born into and needs a family. And the family, essential but itself incomplete, needs civic, religious, and political communities to properly develop according to its higher rational end. This view of human dignity will inevitably complicate the application to bio, of bioethics to public policy. Protecting individual human rights, particularly the right to life, is a more narrow call and is a clear responsibility of the state. Promoting human flourishing as communally envisioned involves multiple spheres of responsibility, not only including the state, but also various civil society institutions, churches, families, and more. Determining whether and when public policy is an appropriate tool for promoting the flourishing of our communities requires nuance and discernment. But my argument today is that this rich, thick understanding of human dignity as fully realized in the context of a flourishing society provides a bridge for developing consensus policy solutions even across major theological and philosophical differences about personhood. So, as an example of how this might play out, let's consider assisted suicide. In the US, 11 jurisdictions have legalized assisted suicide, while another 11 have explicitly banned it. And more than a dozen states will, will or have considered legislation expanding or legalizing assisted suicide this year. Assisted suicide in euthanasia has been legal throughout Canada since 2016 under the term medical aid in dying, or MAID. At first, only the terminally ill were eligible. But the law has since expanded to include those experiencing any, quote, grievous and irremediable condition. Despite promises that MAID would never be provided, according to Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, quote, in a way that isn't because you're not getting the supports and cares you actually need, despite that promise, numerous cases have been reported, including by MAID providers themselves of mentally ill, homeless, and low-income individuals choosing death. For more information about this, I would refer you to a New Atlantis article from early 2023 entitled, No Other Options. Establishing the right to die is a natural extension of a narrow emphasis on privacy and autonomy as the main tenets of human dignity. And the fight for and against assisted suicide has largely been waged on these terms. But what would it look like to consider the individual person as embedded in a web of social relations to whom we have particular obligations? How would that help us come to some consensus on assisted suicide? Well, consider the example of Canadians gaining access to assisted suicide for the grievous and irremediable situation of something like homelessness, which was actually documented in that New Atlantis article for a woman that for the purposes of the next few minutes we'll call Nancy. If we see human dignity in individualistic terms, then we are stuck arguing that our view of human dignity trumps the view of human dignity as autonomy. In other words, we have to violate someone's autonomy, the perceived right to develop their own view of the human person, in order to protect their life. And in our current culture, this line of argument seems futile. But what if instead we articulate a view of human dignity that acknowledges that Nancy's flourishing has been diminished by our failure as a society to come alongside her and help her meet her needs? Instead of fighting dignity as autonomy head on, we begin to support both the civil society institutions and public policies that promote Nancy's dignity as a member of a community. And we acknowledge our obligations to her as part of our community. Instead of telling her, you can't end your life because I think it's wrong, 
we say instead, we value you as a person created in God's image. And as such, we're going to work to develop solutions both to your particular circumstances, and perhaps this is the role of a church or a local nonprofit, and to the larger systemic issues that your circumstances expose. And this might be the role of governmental policy. Practically, this approach also leads us to patient and incremental political strategies, which include thoughtful coalition building, working alongside co-belligerents, in this case, such as the many disability rights groups who oppose assisted suicide. In many cases, lack of access to quality medical, hospice, or other end-of-life care drive the desire to pursue assisted suicide. What would it look like for Christians to work to improve healthcare access and quality hospice care to make assisted suicide unthinkable. Approaching assisted suicide with this common good frameworks, framework provides us an opportunity to live into a whole life ethic which seeks to make euthanasia unthinkable, but not in an instrumental way that uses whole life policies as a means to an end, but in a way that overflows from this expansive view of hum human dignity rooted in a network of interdependencies for which we were created. A common good framework for bioethics and public policy might also help us disentangle some of the mess that we're in about IVF. And this situa situation is indeed a mess for several reasons. First, many pro-life Christian politicians have been quite happy to insist that life begins at conception or fertilization when it comes to abortion, but not when it comes to IVF. And in the wake of the Alabama Supreme Court ruling, this inconsistency was brutally exposed by abortion advocates. And Christians have not really presented a coherent response. This is in part because many Christians, including notable public pro-life evangelical figures, such as former Vice President Mike Pence, have benefited from IVF. The second reason that we're in a mess is that decades ago, pro-life politicians made a strategic decision not to regulate IVF in its infancy because they worried that regulation would open the door to government funding for the practice. I literally had conversations with people when I was on the Hill asking, well, why haven't we tried to put this or that limitation in? And that was the answer I was given. So currently, IVF clinics operate with little to no oversight, and the practice has become broadly normalized in our culture. But through the lens of this wider frame of human dignity based not only on individual rights, but also on our network of relationships and obligations, unregulated IVF should give us some pause. Set aside for a moment the moral status of the embryo and this thorny issue of personhood around which there is so much disagreement. There are several ways that IVF, as it's currently practiced, has the potential to subvert the human flourishing as I've defined it today. First, in order to choose embryos that have the best chance of survival in utero, scientists routinely screen embryos for abnormalities. Embryos with obvious defects are passed over for those with a better statistical chance of survival. During this process, embryos can also be screened to look for the presence of favorable or unfavorable genotypes, including sex and many other traits that are genetically determined. Publicly, clinics advertise screening for diseases caused by a single gene or larger chromosomal abnormalities. Think cystic fibrosis, Down syndrome, or Parkinson's. But there is no federal regulation prohibiting PGD, as it's called, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis, for any trait for which a genetic test is available. This could include selection for height, sex selection, or HLA matching to produce a child who could be a future donor, bone marrow donor, for an ill sibling. All of these are perfectly legal applications at the moment, and many families are taking advantage of these tests. A 2017 study found that over 70% of IVF clinics in the US offer PGD for sex selection. And of those, 80% would offer IVF with PGD for sex selection to a couple that came in and said, I'm not infertile, but I just want to guarantee that I have a boy or a girl. There is the very real danger that IVF and other reproductive technologies are furthering our society's proclivity for treating children as commodities, commodities to be ordered, customized, and purchased as accessories to the American dream. And if you think this is far-fetched, 
scroll through your Instagram feed to see the number of children who are being monetized. Federal regulations limiting gender selection and any other non-medical genetic test on an embryo would push against this trend of reducing children to mere products of technological manipulation. Regulations like these would not de require declaring that an embryo is a person in law, nor would it require banning IVF altogether, but it would call parents to fulfill their God-given responsibilities towards their children, thereby promoting both their dignity and the dignity of their children, which should not be in competition. Furthermore, the view that the commodification of children is morally wrong is a value that we share with friends and neighbors outside the Christian community, providing opportunities for coalition building and real political progress. There's a second way that IVF, as it is currently practiced, subverts human flourishing. IVF is expensive. Each cycle costs between $15,000 and $30,000, and the process is taxing on a woman's body. As a result, clinics are incentivized to maximize the possibility that an IVF cycle will result in a successful pregnancy. This means that some clinics routinely implant two to three embryos at a time in case one or more fails to successfully implant. But of course, sometimes all three survive, leaving the mother in an awful position of being told in many cases that she has to sacrifice one of these developing fetuses in order to save the other. The field caused this a reduction. And think about this situation. This is not an unplanned pregnancy. This family has been struggling with infertility and longing to have children, and then they are told they have to abort one to save the others. Life in this broken world brings enough moral dilemmas on its own. We need not deliberately create such situations. The IVF physician should not put parents in a circumstance that requires them to abdicate their responsibility to a child that they willfully chose to conceive. Regulations could be enacted that would prevent clinics from implanting more than two embryos at a time. And under this scenario, reductions, as they're called, would almost never be advised. There is a third way that IVF, as it's currently practiced, subverts human flourishing. IVF is also used by women who do not want to pay the motherhood penalty in their career. Researchers have shown that for biological reasons, the eggs a woman releases when she's young have fewer genetic abnormalities than those released later in life. With IVF, women can freeze their young eggs and use IVF as a safer way to have children later in life after their career is well established. In 2020, over 13,000 women froze their eggs to delay childbearing. And companies like Facebook and Apple announced in 2014, as soon as the practice went mainstream, that they would cover up to $20,000 of their employees' egg freezing costs. Some touted this as a potential equalizer in the workplace. But of course, having children later in life has its own challenges. Many private adoption agencies actually limit adoption to parents who are under 50. Though not required by law, such provisions acknowledge the lifelong commitments parents make to a child and the very real emotional and physical strain of parenting, as well as the responsibilities that that child is going to have to care for aging parents. IVF may help a woman avoid the motherhood penalty early in her career, only to exact a different tax later in life. If we consider the broader dignity of the mother and the child, and the society shaped by their family, a better solution to the dilemma faced by women who want to pursue a career in family would be to work to mitigate this perceived motherhood penalty. And to acknowledge the obligations between parents and children, we could enact regulations limiting IVF to women under 50. Of course, IVF is just one area in which the fertility industry needs regulating. But the inconsistent application of widely held Christian view of the value of all life has actually interfered with our ability to build coalitions that have the potential to deliver meaningful policy results in this space. Over 15 years ago, when I was working on Capitol Hill, I was at a meeting of pro-life advocates and far-left feminists who had common interest in legislation to prevent human cloning. Cloning a human embryo, whether for research purposes or otherwise, requires women's eggs, and as does surrogacy and some forms of IVF. And some on the left 
were deeply concerned that these technologies would result in the exploitation of vulnerable women for their eggs. Many of the women around that table are household names of the third wave feminist movement and are strong proponents of abortion. Eventually, the conversation came to how we could bridge the deep mistrust that existed between our two constituencies, pro-life conservatives and pro-choice progressives. And I will never forget, Judy Norsigian, author of Our Bodies, Ourselves, looked at me and my colleagues and said, I will have a hard time convincing our people that you truly care about women. They think you only care about embryos. And though we had a productive and cordial conversation, no real coalition emerged from those discussions. These women and I may never agree on abortion policy, but may our political engagement give ample evidence that we care deeply about women made in the image of God who are embedded in a network of interdependent relationships required for their flourishing. I want to close today by giving three examples that make me hopeful this approach can make a real difference in our nation. These are not all bioethics examples. Um, they have deep resonance for me as a mom of four children. Um, and here they are. The first, the effort to pass state laws requiring age verification for pornography websites. In most, if not all, of the 12 states that have passed age verification laws, the pornography companies have just decided to leave the state altogether. Note, the advocates did not, they chose an attainable target rather than going for the gold and trying to ban it altogether. They chose an attainable target that many can agree on. Children should not be able to stumble onto or seek out pornography online. And the result is a vast reduction in how accessible online pornography is for those entire states. The second example is the increasing momentum around limiting social media access and cell phone use for kids. In my Christian community, I found that we are later in giving our phones kids than a lot of others, but increasingly, many people are waking up to the, real, the distractions and the damage that early access to social media has done to our kids. The third example is the coalition that the Center for Public Justice and the Association for Public Justice has built around family supportive policies. The Southern Baptist Policy Arm, the Ethics and Religious Liter Liberty Commission, the National Association for Evangelicals, and the US Conference of Catholic Bishops have joined with advocates across the spectrum to call for modest expansions to the child tax credit in an effort to support more low-income families. I think this shows that I'm not alone in embracing a more expansive view of human dignity. Now, not all of these efforts have even been led by Christians. Imagine if we channeled all of our anti-abortion energy into this broad view of human dignity that honors the relationships and responsibilities for which we are made. The public bioethics conversations of the 21st century will be much more nuanced and complicated than the abortion debate of the last 50 years. Should Medicare and Medicaid substitute AI robots in assisted living facilities and nursing homes? Should we allow or fund Elon Musk's human brain interface chip? What limits should we place on the human likeness of AI? What is the line between ameliorating physical ailments and promoting human enhancement? If we as Christians want to thoughtfully speak into the way these and other technologies are shaping our future, we will need to move beyond a reductionist approach to human dignity a focus on human dignity that elevates the biblical picture of communal flourishing will enable us to develop relationships and build coalitions that will ensure we have a trusted seat at the table as these complex issues unfold. Wendell Berry said, there is in practice no such thing as autonomy. Practically, there is only a distinction between responsible and irresponsible dependence. May we work together to cultivate a society where responsible dependence is increasingly encouraged. Thank you. Uh, David Urban, I'm an English professor here at Calvin College and I, uh, Calvin University. 
and I have an MDiv from Trinity. <laughs> <laughs> Great. And used to teach there. Um, but I'm also the uh, longtime faculty advisor for the pro-life group here at Calvin. And, uh, you know, uh, principally, if, if I definitely believe that life begins at conception. Um, I'm also seeing how, you know, with the various referendums and what have you for state constitutions here in Michigan, we got our rears kicked. Mm-hmm. And excuse me, but you, if you mm-hmm. don't mind me saying it that way, and um, it, it seems on so many levels a losing battle that will have wider ramifications even beyond that that uh, incredibly important issue. So what I'm hearing you say as you discuss this, and of course the image of God is is so foundational. I'm so thankful that you're emphasizing that. Um, is this idea of an attainable goal. You mentioned that specifically with age verification for pornography sites, for example. Hard to argue against that, right? But, but it winds up being a larger victory than just that particular issue because, as you say, they close shop. So I think what I'm seeing you do here is focus on that idea of prudence, right? The idea of, of the attainable, not, not the ideal that can't be attained within this fallen world um, and so I'm I I think it's I think what you're saying is, is very important I'm wondering how you this hope right you're trying to be hopeful right because people are we see these defeats and we want to just kind of hunker down in our barriers and just sort of not get involved anymore because we've lost so many battles mm-hmm. So what would you say in response to that, in response to, you know, this idea of, say, the, the, the American paganism, there's that, that book coming out, or it just came out in Regnery, um, that it's just going to be a very violent society as Christianity wanes. Is this a way to push against Christianity's waning uh, within the public square, et cetera? Sorry for the long question, but I hope yeah, that makes no, sense. No, I, do, to, I do think so. I, um, I mean, just principally, when it... I grew up in Atlanta. I was in New Jersey and then Boston and then come back to the South. And my experience as a Christian in each of those geographies has been very different. And I did appreciate about Boston, which was much more post-Christian than, say, Atlanta, that when I went to church, we were talking about this earlier today, when I went to church at Boston, everybody who was there really wanted to be there and were very committed. And I think historically we see the church itself prospers in situations where we're an increasing minority. So I'm not worried on that front. Whatever the Lord intends there, I'm confident he has good things in store. But I don't think we have to give up to this, like, oh, it's just all going to be terrible post-Christian, because I do think the embedded goods that we want to see, like the, the woman in my neighborhood who's the most active in our school district on cell phones in schools, I'm confident, is not a person of faith. That, but there's a good that she sees, and maybe some of that comes from the good that she knows because God created her like to know these goods, right? But she sees these goods, and we can work alongside that, and maybe that opens the door for us to have conversations about faith that right. a, a retreat and an abandonment is not going to have. So right. um, that's part of why I am hopeful, because I think these coalitions actually allow Christians to be winsome in real relationships, that can be a difference maker. We're talking about local communities yes. that it build um, and our public witness on the national stage as well. So I don't know if that fully answers your uh, question. No, but... your, your answer is very helpful. And it's, uh, as you say, a, a vehicle for sharing the gospel as well as you find common ground on these important issues. Yeah. Thank you. My name is Roger Henderson. I'm a friend of uh, Undermind. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I have a very strange suggestion. I think somebody ought to do some research. Uh, you know, in Iowa, they do a lot of, I'm mean, sure they do it in the state too, but breeding of cows and sheep. And I know there are places where they breed a lot of dogs. I know this is a very off the wall suggestion. Somebody do a research project. These are businesses, they have 
statistics, and they have numbers, they count all this stuff. I'd like somebody to don't tell them what you're doing, go to as many <laughs> as possible and find out when they move some animal onto the, I don't know, the, the number counted of successful dogs. We now, and at what level, you know, after they've, especially with the cows in Iowa, I know they do sex, sex you know, they, what do they call it, pick out the male or the female mm -hmm. and all that. Do you get what I'm talking about without saying, I didn't say it at all clearly, but when they count it on their, on their chart, their, their, you know, like numbers for these are successfully bred, now we have a hundred dogs of this kind ready, or not ready, but yeah, no, I think, start yeah. counting them. And that might give, be kind of a fun, interest, fun, yeah, interesting, yeah, I think that's way interesting way to find out when do breeders start counting these as, okay, this is now a dog, this is now a cow, a calf, a goat, Whatever. I think that's interesting. I think, though, and maybe it's because we've moved beyond modernity to modernity. I mean, the other way, beyond modernity to post-modernity. I don't know that the scientific answer matters. I was thinking about this a lot in preparing for this. You know, as a scientist, and I think well, certainly 15 years ago when I was on the Hill, there are good things that have come from the pro-life movement trying to meet the world on its kind of enlightenment scientific terms. There are true scientific realities, but it doesn't help us when we talk about gender, and it doesn't help us when we talk about life. The biological realities are irrelevant to the conversation because we have expressive individualism, which says the biology doesn't matter. I can be whoever I want to be. So I don't, I mean, I don't know any scientist that disputes that a different human, different than its mother and father, is made at conception. The question has always been when when does that creature exert responsibilities on the parent? And that's where there's been such disagreement. Um, I, I think the scientific question is pretty clear. It's the metaphysical, philosophical question of when that person has dignity deserving of protection. And some people, you may have heard of Peter Singer at Princeton, you know, he carries it to its logical extension. He's very utilitarian, like even infants can be killed because they don't have rational capacity. Like, that's, that's the other end. He's not disputing that a new human is made at conception, but it's irrelevant. And I think it's becoming increasingly irrelevant um, as our society does this weird kind of divorce from facts that we're doing all over the place. Science is only, only one of those areas. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture, uh, Jesse Covington, Westmont College. Um, I'm wondering if you could expand on what you were just speaking on. It's, uh, in a post fact based political discourse, I think what I'm wondering is where are the apologetic inroads for a relational and responsibility-based understanding of dignity, um, where are the inroads to see that do any better? That is, where, if someone's really committed to the expressive individualist model um, right. for dignity, um, the relationship and responsibility are going to butt up against that. Right. Where have you seen uh, fruitful apologetic inroads for making some headway using this approach? Um, I think that's an interesting question, one and one that I was thinking about even as I was crafting this. The first thing I want to say is to give a, a shout out for Erica Bakiaki's work. She's applying this relationship and responsibility directly to the issue of abortion and calling mothers to their obligations and responsibilities um, from a natural law framework. Um, and the book, I haven't read her book yet, but the book she's written is about how that was how the original feminist Mary Wollstonecraft in particular, that's how they envisioned women's rights were in this network of responsibilities. So um, I would love to ask her that same question because she's dealing with it in the very um, contentious space of abortion. I think though, what we see is there are a lot of internal inconsistencies in, the, in our current cultural space, right? And one of them, expressive individualism, the very folks who tout that are also, I mean, inclusion is one of the watchwords of the day. 
and um, respect for other cultures. There are other non-individualist cultures who have a lot to teach us. So meeting, um, let's say, a more progressive audience on their terms, where they talk about inclusiveness and communal cultures. And if you want to highlight, like, the East and the various ways that responsibilities between parents and children are highly honored, that could be an inroad because it's a value they already hold. And maybe we help expose the own internal inconsistencies. How can they, how can they themselves support a community that is not at all about expressive individualism? So that would be, um, that would be one answer. And I do think certain kinds of reality still matter. The reason that the cell phone issue is turning is because people know families with anxious and mentally ill teenagers. That's why. It's personal. It's become personal for families. If it's not in their family, it's in the family of someone they know. And so all of the philosophy that they may hold to goes out the window when it's someone they love who's ill. That's what we face on the other side as well. But I think um, when we can show statistically that you know, social media use is harming, especially young teenage girls, then we have a case. And so I, I do think there's a place for good work and good data, um, but it tends to hit that emotional core rather than the intellectual core. So those are the things that just come to mind. Mm -hmm. so I'm gonna echo the, uh, Jesse's thanks. Michael Watson, Calvin, uh, Mercy. Um, this is just a sort of thoughtful, convictional thinking and, and address that we're looking for with a, a Henry lecture. So my question, I want to ask you a little bit about how you framed things when you were talking about Nancy and the, the potential end of life. And I think I, I would agree that um, if, we're, if the pro-life movement and other uh, adjacent movements put all their eggs in the autonomy basket, then we're, we're putting a to mix metaphors, we're building on sand, mm -hmm. right? Um, at the same time, and so I, so I would agree that we would not want to come to that person and say, your view of autonomy is wrong, ours is right, so we're going to force you. And the more holistic approach that you described sounds like exactly what we should be doing and, and what a lot, of, a lot of alpha crisis pregnancy centers are doing and things like that. At the same time, the law is either going to say, yes, you can do this, or, or no, you can't. Right. So I'm wondering if it's a, if it's a, 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 a both end to some extent so that the, the, the red state governor has a chance to sign a law that might find a way to compassionately still deny, to say no, so could you speak a little bit about those, those things? Yeah, and I think absolutely. And this is where working alongside. So the disability rights community hates assisted suicide because they know that the end, the extrapolation, is you say I shouldn't be here. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but just this week there's an article that's come out from the Netherlands. There's a woman who's 29 and who is scheduled her euthanasia procedure because she has autism and depression and I think a mood or personality disorder and has decided that life is not worth living, even though she's in love with her partner, she says. Um, yeah, I think that's an, those, the disability community sees situations like that and says, wait, you're saying that my life is worth ending because I'm not typical? Like, so we have a, a broad chance to not approach it on autonomy grounds, but on dignity grounds of other sorts and to come alongside communities. And interestingly, when it comes to end of life, the AMA is dead set against it still. They have come out repeatedly year after year and say, we don't want to be involved in this. We are doctors. We don't want to be helping someone in their life. So that, I mean, the AMA and pro-life community have never been on the same team. But I think this is another place to come alongside. And, you know, absolutely. Could we turn the tide and um, enact more laws, but I think we'll have more resonance as we fight for laws banning assisted suicide if we're doing that holistic work and coming alongside it. Well, it strikes me that that young woman you're uh, mentioning she says she doesn't even want to have a funeral because she doesn't think her friends, whoever they might be, will even want to <coughs> come to the right. funeral, right? It, it, that, that ultimate humiliation of one's insignificance in the eyes mm. of the world, those who are supposed to love her. Obviously, that's an opportunity for Yes. Um, how do you, again, you know, i um, thinking a lot about you know, the, the effect of these lockdowns on the church and still decreased in-person attendance, what have mm -hmm. you. Um, maybe speak to that, 
this, this idea that even within the church, we become so enclosed just about our own family and our own concerns to the point where we're not even looking out for, for those within the church, much less beyond. And, and when we would have a chance to reach out to someone like that who's just begging, that's right. got to be a cry for help. Well, that's she right. says that, isn't it? That's right. No, I, I completely agree. And I think there are many ways in which our society as it's currently structured is fighting against the kind of community that I think if you look at the New Testament and see what the early church was supposed to be, what it was, it was inviting people into this deep community that was satisfying at so many levels. That is not how most churches are operating now. And it's for a gazillion reasons. I think, um, you know, David Brooks and others have done some work about how we're sort of sorting ourselves. That's part of the problem. I think as a parent of four kids that are between the ages of 10 and 17, um, the compulsion that many families feel to have their kids busy all the time doesn't leave space for welcoming a woman with that kind of need. That, anybody with that kind of need is work and energy and time. And are we leaving ourselves enough margin in our lives to absorb the pain of the world in that way? Some people are, but they tend to be the exception. I read an interesting article just today in Plow about a woman who, um, she said she um, was kind of raised a Democrat, was concerned about housing issues, and she's come to the conviction. She runs a, um, a housing nonprofit in Cincinnati that relationships are just as important as housing for lifting people out of an unhoused, especially women, single moms out of an unhoused situation. And both having a partner and a wider community to help raise, you know, raise kids. Like these, the kind of picture I'm presenting today is one that I think people are increasingly coming to. I will say that anecdotally, most of the people writing about this are women. Um, I think you know, it would be great to see more men in that conversation as well, because I do think men think about relationship differently. They engage in relationship differently. Um, what does it look like to think about this holistically with all of our, all of our um, perspectives at the table? Once again, would you join me in thanking Michelle Kirtley for joining us? So that brings uh, the lecture to a close. Um, we hope you will join us if you want to continue the conversation out uh, these doors. There will be some refreshments. We invite you to keep up with what the Henry Institute is up to. We are now on Twitter and Facebook and Insta. And we have an email um, thing as well. And Kylie would be the one to. And I also want to take a moment to, to recognize um, Kylie, who has done a ton of work to make the things happen uh, with this conference. So thank you, Kylie, um, for doing that. And thank you for, for coming out tonight. Um, grateful for our partners with CPJ and other folks who have, have sponsored us. We do have some great panels tomorrow as well, so check out the schedule. It started early at 8.30, but there'll be substantive and fun and spicy even. More discussion of Christian nationalism and all sorts of uh, other, not just that, but other things too. So check out the schedule. We hope to see you tomorrow. Have a great night. Hope to continue the conversation outside those doors.